very honoured to be joined by Mia, who has written an absolutely phenomenal book, The Right to Sex, which every, just while you're watching this now or listening to it on the podcast, just buy it now, instantly. Boom, like that. It is absolutely brilliant. It's so, it will always be topical, but so I was going to say it's particularly topical right now, but actually I think it's one of those books which regardless of the circumstances will always have themes which are particularly salient. But thank you so much for joining us. Thanks so much for having me here, Owen. So I think what is on a lot of people's minds at the moment is <laughs> the horrific events which taken place in Plymouth. Um, in which five people have died. And we, obviously, there was an investigation in, 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 in process, um, with all those caveats aside, but we know that the uh, gunman posted videos online which clearly subscribe to incel ideology. Um, do you just want to explain for people clearly? Because a lot, some of the news reports on this have not been helpful, I would say. Uh, they kind of talk about Intel being like some sort of coherent cohesive mm -hmm. group or movement, uh, which isn't obviously true, but some people might not know that. So do you just want to unpack your your kind of reaction to what these events and what it tells us and what, what do we mean by Intel? What does mm -hmm. that actually mean? Because there's so much confusing coverage for lots of people. Right. So... Literally speaking, the word incel is just a shortening of uh, involuntary celibate. So it's supposed to pick out any person who involuntarily isn't having sex or maybe has never had sex. <clears throat> In practice, though, it picks out a member of a very specific subculture. So I don't think of um, incels as any kind of political movement, but I do think uh, they constitute a subcultural phenomenon um, of typically young men who are extremely angry um, and disenchanted <clears throat> by, as they see it, their marginalization within like the sexual economy and their low status within a sexual hierarchy. Um, and they, you know, unfortunately, very frequently act out uh, this perspective violently by killing people. So Elliot Rogers, probably the most high profile case, but we also had the Toronto van attack and now we have what happened at Plymouth. Um, so there's a very kind of clear connection between the radicalization um, that happens online and these online forums with um, actual material, material action. And it, it was, it was striking in these videos. I mean, he, he was 22 mm -hmm. and was speaking as though his life was over. It was too late to, to salvage. But part of what he was talking about in these misogynistic videos, which he posted online, was, again, this incel ideology, which, I mean, maybe just unpack this a bit. It's this yeah. idea that 80% um, that of women are only, they're going after 20% of the most attractive men and therefore leaving lots of other men deprived of what they see as their right to sex. Right, exactly. And I mean, so uh, there's there's a, on one hand the kind of official line that incels take and then there's the kind of deeper diagnosis that we can offer. So the official line is that, you know, a small number of men, chads are hoarding all of the women or a big proportion of that women sort of not leaving enough for, you know, the <laughs> everyone else. Now, of course, this is already on its on its own terms incredibly problematic because it's positioning women as a kind of resource that can can be hoarded right um as and 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 to which people can be entitled right to which men can be entitled but looking further <clears throat> looking like more deeply into it um I mean, first of all, that's just like statistically not true, right? So there are all of these sociologists who will just tell you that actually like there are a vanishing small proportion of men who are having sex with lots of women. Um, it's just, there, there just isn't a kind of capture of 80% of women. Um, and that actually there are very, very few people who are, um, you know, totally uh, celibate, involuntarily celibate, and lots of them are women, right? So that's kind of, kind of the reality of it. Uh, so what I think of what's sort of really going on with incels, despite their just like claim as to being like lonely and left out, is <clears throat> a deep rage at a sexual hierarchy that they think 
um, that they register too, too low on, right? Because they're not interested in women in general. They're not interested in companionship. They're not interested in like mutuality or recognition. What they're interested in is acquiring a certain kind of high status woman, right? A woman who they think of as um, accruing to them a certain amount of social capital. So they're very interested in, you know, what they like, like Stacey's, right? So white, blonde, like stereotypically attractive, skinny women. Those are the women they want. So these, these things, the incel discourse can wear the veneer of um, the cry of loneliness, but fundamentally what I think it's about is about hierarchy. Um, and it's a social hierarchy that in one sense they critique right? Because they're very angry at those who dominate the hierarchy. And they're very angry at the fact that they're, that they perceive themselves to be low on the hierarchy. At the same time, they're not actually interested in dismantling that hierarchy or any other, right? So they're very invested in, for example, hierarchies of women, uh, racial hierarchies, hierarchies of attractiveness, hierarchies of class. So Elliot Roger was obsessed with the fact that he was from a very wealthy family. He talked about the fact that he was um, supposedly descended from British aristocrats. He hated uh, young black men who were more romantically successful than him. So in a way, they're like halfway to a kind of radical critique, but then they bluntly drop off the cliff of just extremism and entitlement. I mean, that, that issue of racialization, I'm mm. interested in partly. I mean, this is an odd thing for me to suddenly throw in, but I will throw it in because I thought it was quite, I found it quite an interesting insight. There was a viral alt-right um, meme that in the first book that I wrote, which is called Chaz, The Demonization of the Working Class. You I wrote the book. Uh, well, you know, <laughs> but uh, 10 years old, but no, but the, the, it's really, okay, this is really bizarre to have to unpack this. And a lot of people are gonna go, okay, left field, but it makes sense. There is a theory online, which has been popularized on 4chan, which is for those who don't know a website where often intel ideology and alt-right ideologies are propagated that I was turned gay because I walked in on my girlfriend having sex with a black man and that I was uh, turned on by this experience. And that's what I was cooked, uh, maybe explain mm. that in. And that's what, that's what turned me gay. Now, I don't know why, I mean, there is a large section of the alt-right community who believe this is something which quite randomly appears in a book about the demonization of working class communities. <laughs> uh, it's really bad. It's like, it's not, it's got it like, contains multitudes. It does. Yeah. But what's going on there? Because they yeah. specifically made, so they were like, I was cooked. Uh, and that's what turned me into a gay man. And they made the racialization, you know, or the fact it was a black man who was having sex with my girlfriend. That was key to the whole narrative. What's going yeah. on there? Yeah. Well, I think the thought is that, you know, when you encountered your white girlfriend with uh, this, you know, fictional black man, you came to realize that you couldn't possibly live up to the demands and norms of masculinity, right? Which like this, this black man does. Um, so what you have this, you have this very kind of old school trope right, that you find under all conditions of colonialism um, and basically any kind of place where white domination rules of the black man who steals uh, the white woman from the white man, right, and is like a threat because of that, combined with this idea of your being like this beta male who's cucked, right? Um, and often, of course, it's like leftist males who are seen as having been cucked, right, because they have um, resigned the kind of traditional power of masculinity, allowing themselves to be emasculated, emasculated by like more powerful men. This is of course part of the Jordan Peterson uh, worldview. So that's what happened to you, Owen. I have an explanation. It's, honestly, it's completely, I, I get it. What, every every week or so, someone pops up with that, that as a fact. Um, let's talk about Me Too. So for many women, Me Too was an overdue moment mm. that, here I am as a man now explaining me too. Okay, great. But I mean, it was, you know, women felt particularly in all these industries that powerful men uh, could sexually harass and worse women 
that it was their voice, their their voices were erased, they weren't listened to because of the power dynamics. And finally, they had a platform in which they could finally be believed and take on those systemic institutionalized uh, forms of, uh, well, often outright male violence against women mm. within the industry, sexual harassment and so on. What's your thoughts on that? Because Me Too, mm. you know, time's up. That's what the slogan was because it was, it is finally now we suddenly have some power that we've been deprived of and mm. this is going to turn, this is going to change the dynamics or has to change the dynamics forever. What, what's your take mm. on that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's undeniable that Me Too had this extraordinary power. I mean, it was like possibly the first internet moment of mass consciousness raising. I mean, really genuinely mass, right? In the sense that it was very mainstream. Although I think it's important to note that while Me Too made a lot of headway in the US and the UK and other countries like India and Japan, it was sort of less successful in some other countries or, 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 or just penetrated less into other countries. And I think there's a kind of interesting story there. But, you know, I mean, I think it wasn't, I think, so I think part of it was the, the feeling of empowerment, but, but even prior to that was just a feeling of, oh, wow, this thing that I thought was just a very personal experience is actually a collective experience. And precisely because it's a collective experience, it's a social and thus political problem, right? Which is the very traditional form of what happens in uh, a 1970s consciousness racing group is you sort of get together, you talk about your experiences, all these things that you think are highly, highly idiosyncratic and personal turn out to be shared. Um, and part of the shared condition maybe of womanhood and that recognition is the, the the first step towards addressing a kind of underlying social and political reality and so that's a very heady and empowering feeling i think when when um when you have a moment when you have a moment like that um but those moments have their limits i mean consciousness raising has its has its limits um <clears throat> i mean i think the basic limit to me too is that it focuses on what all women have on have in common right and you might think well this is exactly what feminism should do right so just about every woman who's worked or been uh in in a university or really any kind of public setting has mm -hmm. experienced sexual harassment of one form or another and so it holds out the promise of being this kind of great unifying experience um but the but the problem with the focus on what all women have in common sort of paradoxically is that it detracts or it can detract from what afflicts the worst off women so just like take sexual harassment at, at work i mean for the worst off women like i mean even just thinking about the us and the uk for the worst off women um in anglo-america uh sexual harassment is just not the worst thing about their jobs. It's just one element in this kind of broader matrix of oppression at work, right? Which, which involves horrifically low wages, precarity, uh, maybe like illegality in the case of, you know, um, of not having secure immigration status. And then, and then so the focus on sexual harassment will never begin to disentangle all of all of that, right? What sort of devastates the working lives of most working women? Um, so, so you, you can sort of see this kind of logic playing out again and again through the history of kind of feminist movements, but also, you know, um, <clears throat> working class movements, uh, anti-racist movements, like anytime you just focus on what like every person in a certain kind of oppressed group has in common, you're going to be kind of, I think, systematically obscuring what makes like the worst off members of that class the worst off. And I think that's that's more or less what has happened to me too. I mean, there's a huge amount of focus on, um, you know, the what what makes the working lives of Hollywood actresses really bad. And I'm not denying that those, those lives are really, uh, their working lives are um, horrifically impaired by sexism, they are. Um, but like, what are we gonna do about the women who like clean the bathrooms of Hollywood? Um, that can very easily drift out of the conversation. Of course, there have been people who have been um, pushing Me Too in precisely that direction, uh, but I don't think that has been the mainstream thrust of Me Too. And there's a kind of obvious reason, like people want to talk about themselves in politics. Um, and because the self is exciting, the self is the center of one's own world. And making that kind of 
transformative political movement from where you're like, okay, right, you've had this experience, but how do we link up this experience with all of these other people you need to stand in solidarity with? That's an organizing challenge. And I because don't they, think it's one that like the, the, the leaders of Me Too have really confronted. Because the class relationships that exist within society were replicated in the Me Too movement. So the priorities, which are undeniable that exist within Me Too, and so that, that Me Too raised, focused on the conditions facing the most privileged. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's interesting, um, you know, so <clears throat> in thinking about, you know, the conversation about um, whether like Me Too has gone too far, which is I think a terrible way of thinking about it, right? Like Me Too is not something that is just moving in a single direction. It contains lots of different possibilities and potentialities within it, right? Um, <clears throat> But, you know, there have been various feminists, um, often like queer feminists, who've been critical of what they see as a certain kind of uh, punitive carceral logic within Me Too. Um, I mean, so someone like Masha Gessen, um, a New Yorker writer uh, um, and like queer activist, you know, has has written in about um, the way in which like Me Too can like in some cases sort of takes the form of a sex panic. Mm -hmm. And Gessen says, look, on one hand, as someone who's been subjected to a lot of sexual harassment by men, like I'm on the side of me too. And on the other hand, like as a queer person, um, I like panic when I sniff a sex panic, right? And I think there's a certain kind of mainstream me to um, feminist who, who wants to just disregard those kind of worries that come from like queer feminists or, uh, like feminists of color, poor feminists, as just being kind of like reactionary and on the side of male power. On that point, the, the kind of castle point, I suppose. Um, I mean, one of the key slogans or themes was believe women. That mm. when, because, you know, if we look at the general statistics in British society, um, it's estimated about 400,000 women are sexually assaulted a year, 85 to 90,000 women mm. are raped. But there is no justice in the vast majority of those cases. Some have argued that rape is essentially decriminalized in Britain because mm -hmm. to rape is to get away with it. So what would you, you know, that's why I suppose a lot, that, that I mean, that's what partly underpinned this moment, wasn't it? It was the mm -hmm. sense of men simply just are allowed to get away with it. That's, you know, that their male violence, male harassment against women, is, is is simply so pandemic, so ingrained in, in the social fabric mm. that it's only in extreme, or in, in, in some very few cases where there is any sort of accountability or justice. So what would your take be on that? And the whole notion of believe women mm. and some of the dynamic, the historical precedent, mm. the racial dynamics as well, which yeah. complicate this. Yeah, so I think your account of um, like the, the pull, the intuitive pull of believe women as a slogan is it's absolutely correct, right? So I think we can think of believe women, believe women as a kind of gesture of epistemic solidarity, right? So you know that in general women aren't believed when they make accusations less against at least certain men. Um, those accusations, if they're made at all in a kind of public forum. Uh, very rarely manifest in uh, legal action or or justice or remedy, <clears throat> and so I think that's that's the necessary background for understanding something like believe women, which is why the idea that somehow like the notion of believe women violates the presumption of innocence is so ridiculous. I mean, the presumption of innocence is a is a legal notion, right? It's like in a court of law, you've got to treat Harvey Weinstein as um, no more likely to assault anyone than like your grandmother I'm not, I'm, I, and or my grandmother, right? Uh, but that doesn't mean that like in general, that's what we need uh, to think. Like when we're not serving on a jury, like what we should really just believe is, well, maybe Harvey Weinstein's like, like I can't, I can't draw any conclusions on the basis of the testimony of these, you know, dozens of women who have who have come out and credibly and consistently told stories um, that very much fit with what we could expect of an industry like Hollywood. Um, <clears throat> so I think 
so that's the kind of pull towards believe women. And I don't want to deny the, um, the legitimacy of that pull. At the same time, as you kind of uh, suggest, there's this, there's a problematic racial history to the presumption that we should just believe women. Um, so obviously men of color, especially black men have been historically falsely accused of rape of white women, very often by white men. Uh, so Emmett Till here, of course, is the most, most famous case. Um, just explain that case just quickly because a lot of people won't know it. Right, so this happened <clears throat> in, uh, in the South, in, in the US, uh, a, a young white woman claimed that a young, very young black boy um, sexually propositioned her or whistled at her in a kind of lascivious manner. And that woman's husband and his brother very violently uh, murdered uh, Till, desecrating his body. They were um, acquitted in court and then sold their story for a, a lot of money, sold the story of how they did it for a huge amount of money to, to a magazine. Um, so when we're thinking about the politics of something like Me Too, uh, sorry, Believe Her, we've got to be thinking about the politics of something like the false rape accusation against a black boy like Emmett Till. We should also be thinking about the systematic disbelief um, <clears throat> that the victims of R. Kelly, almost all of whom were black, faced. Right. And in fact, when he was acquitted in one of his trials, one of the jurors who was white said, you know, I just didn't believe any of the women like they were just like they were these black women. I didn't believe them. I didn't like how they dressed. I didn't like how they acted. And one of the things that a, a black feminist like Angela Davis points out is that <clears throat> the will to believe that black men are just kind of essentially rapists. Right. Uh, is the flip side of a racist coin. Um, whose other side is is the is the, the is the image of like the black woman as hypersexual and therefore kind of unrapeable, um, you know, in, in the sense that you you can't rape a black woman because um, you know she, she her her promiscuity means that she's already always given some kind of consent, right? And those two things for someone like Davis go together, and I think that's a very powerful idea. So <clears throat> I think that very long history of false accusations. Um, against men of color. Uh, and I mean, I should just say that like in the US right now, for example, um, black men are disproportionately uh, convicted of rape and sexual assault as compared with white men, right? So you can see that in the exoneration rates. Um, so, and what's also interesting about, about that is that <clears throat> very often the reason black men are falsely convicted of sexual assault in the US is not because of like white women per se, but because of like basically like the race, racial, racist criminal justice system. So like cops who just want to pin it on someone and then so kind of induce false witness statements, right? And the fact that white people are kind of systematically bad at telling black people apart, yeah. you know, conduces to this form of injustice. So I think all of this means we have to think in a much more complicated way about the economy of belief when it comes to sexual assault. I mean, it's uh, the birth of a nation, which is a notorious, mm -hmm. well, I think the first, often described as one of the first blockbuster films, the profoundly mm -hmm. racist film, which helped for pre all the, the, the refounding of the Ku Klux Klan. It, it presented explicitly, didn't it? Mm -hmm. Men, as, black men as rapists and sexual mm -hmm. aggressors. That was always very much a fundamental core of often the form of, institutionalized racism in the US. On, on the other, that just linked to that is, I suppose, and you, you talk about this as well, it, it's, it's what's sometimes been described as gay panic or mm. where basically um, straight men who have assaulted or killed either gay men, cisgender gay men or, or trans women on the basis um, that they either they had been come on to and sexually propositioned um, or they didn't realize a trans woman was a trans woman, for example. Mm -hmm. I mean, what that also plays into it, doesn't it? These, you know, mm -hmm. kind of who's to be believed. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, in those cases, it's men 
overwhelmingly in those particular cases. But but that how does that play into into all of this? Yeah, I think that's a really interesting question. I mean, you know, there's just <clears throat> what's not going to work politically is just like a general kind of practice of total epistemic deference. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the left gets itself in certain kinds of trouble when it, um, when it runs the, the very correct thought that um, in, in general, we would be better off politically if we like paid attention to the lived experience and testimony of people in oppressed social positions. Run together that thought with the thought like, oh, whenever anyone says something that something bad happened to them, we've got to like believe them, right? And I think those two thoughts need to be kind of kept separate, right? Because as the case of like trans or gay panic shows, you know, sometimes people very seriously like i mean okay so so there are two ways of thinking about what's going on in like the trans or gay panic case right so and, and there are probably two kinds of cases so there's the case in which um uh you know the person uh sort of murders <laughs> the other person just like in cold blood as it were right and then he uses the the excuse of gay or trans panic as like as, a, as an excuse as a way of exonerating themselves. But then there's the case of the person who like actually kind of freaks out, right? Because they've worked themselves into a sort of anxiety and unresolved anxiety. In which case, like in some sense, like it might be true that they like felt unsafe, but that's just not a feeling that we should like give political credence to, right? You can't build a politics, you can't build a liberatory or egalitarian politics around just wanting to preserve everyone's feeling of being undisturbed and unthreatened in every possible way, right? I mean, it just is what it is to like live in a democratic mm -hmm. society um, that we come up against people who like live their lives very differently. And in so doing kind of pose questions about how we ourselves live our lives, right? I mean, um, like Sean Fay's new book, uh, The Transgender Issue, like ends with this just wonderful line. I hope she doesn't mind if I kind of give a spoiler here about, you know, which basically diagnoses at least some of transphobia in um, what she calls like the gleaming opulence of like trans lives, right? Like the, like, sorry, sorry the, op the gleaming opulent freedom of like trans lives, right? The, um, and I think that's right. So like we, we threaten each other by like living our lives different and, so and sometimes living out possibilities that um, are existentially threatening to other people. Um, and that's why I think you can't kind of embrace it just a simple politics of safety or a politics where we just like believe people um, when they say that uh, a response was something that they did was a kind of necessary response to a perceived fear. Ellie Mae Hagan, who is a, a, a friend, uh, but a, a left wing journalist, the director of the think tank class, she, she, she wants to know if she, the fact the debate is focused so much on yes or no consent is mm -hmm. papering over the fact that a lot of men lack emotional intelligence and an ability to empathize, i.e. we can't possibly expect you to read a woman's cues so instead listen to the magic word. She's there paraphrasing the position. Mm. Yeah, I think that's a really good question. So <clears throat> one really does hear this thought a lot from, from men, right, since Me Too, um, this thought where well, look, I just sort of don't know what it is women are saying. They are like so enig so enigmatic um, uh, that now I'm really anxious that totally unknowingly, unwittingly, I'm just going to be like violating these new and swiftly changing social norms and get myself in trouble. Um, so I don't want to say that there could be no such cases, right? Like we're, 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 humans are complex and difficult. And sometimes we like misread each other, maybe, maybe a lot of the time. But I do want to suggest that that narrative itself is often kind of ideological. So, I mean, take someone like Louis C.K., who I write about a little bit in the book. So on one hand, he want, you know, he apologized, of course, and then did a set very quickly thereafter. I mean, apologized for masturbating in front of lots of women non-consensually. Um, apologizes and then quickly does a, a set after in which he um, is like in, incredibly uh, vicious about feminists, about um, trans people, 
by Asian people and so on. Um, <clears throat> and it was to a sellout crowd, by the way. So, you know, you can be canceled and still do extremely well financially. Mm -hmm. So Louis C.K., you know, wants to be one of those men who claims that, like, he just didn't know the effect he was having on the these women, right? Because women are so mysterious. How could you possibly know that it's not okay to just take out your penis and, and, and masturbate in front of them, um, even if they've showed no interest in it? But there's this one case in which he does ask a woman and kind of in a rhetorical way, I think, and he and this woman says no. And he turns bright red. And I just think that's interesting. Like, why the blush? Why the blush of shame? Right. Um, when you actually go into a lot of these stories of forms of sexual harassment and abuse, what you get are these kind of telltale signs of men detecting the resistance that women are putting up mm -hmm. and choosing to ignore it or override it. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not saying we couldn't have better education of, um, of how to like read each other and communicate with each other, but I think the, but I think we would be naive um, if we were, if we insisted that the problem was just communication, mm -hmm. right? Because I actually think a lot of the times, like historically, like women, men have lived alongside women, you know, forever and have heard their, various forms of private resistance and seen those acts of private resistance. Um, and, <clears throat> and so I think that that narrative that Ellie's picking out um, needs to be itself interrogated. Mm -hmm. And we need to ask those men like, really? Nothing? You have no idea what's going on? Linked, well not linked, this in terms of consent, but also actually, Actually, no, well, the yeah. kink, this is coming up. This is coming up a fair bit, kink. Yeah. So Kieran God asked, to what extent do you think the gold standard of affirmative joyful consent is problematized in the case of queer and kink modalities, which are often sadly explored tentatively, messily with degrees of societally imposed shame? Amru also asks, Amru al uh, often known as the stage name Glamru, do you follow them? Uh, genuine ethical question, uh, having read the incredible book, how do we go about understanding how our desires are politically formed without pathologizing our desires too harshly, e.g. does this lead to kink shaming, for example? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, so this is something I'm, I'm, I'm very concerned with, and I'll, I'll, tr I'll try and give my sort of um, my preliminary answer, but it's, more, it's mostly just kind of to register a series of worries than it is to, to offer, especially um, an answer to Amory's fantastic question. <clears throat> So on one hand, in, in, the, in the book and in the essay on which, um, from which the book gets its title, I want to you know, reopen the kind of political critique of desire that was very popular within sort of 1970s feminism, right? And I want to do it for sort of intersectional reasons, right? Because I want us to interrogate the way in which racism or ableism um, or heteronormativity uh, shapes who who is desired um, and how they're desired and how we express our uh, our desires <clears throat> and there's this worry that engaging in such a project um, leads to uh, a kind of um, purity politics in the first personal case and a kind of moral authoritarianism in the second personal case right and so then all of a sudden everyone has to be engaged in a project of like policing their desires uh, and and that maybe ultimately that leads us to a place also of, of thinking that only a very small class of uh, desires or sex acts are, are actually okay, right? And so something like kink uh, might, might fall outside of that. I mean, I think it's important to, one thing to say is to kind of distinguish between um, those kind of oppressive forces that delimit who is desired mm -hmm. from those social and political forces that um, shape like what kind of sex acts we desire. Now, of course, those two things aren't totally separable because we want to do certain sex acts with certain people. But at the same time, the thing I'm really taking issue with is the way in which certain people are coded as like not sexually desirable and the way in which that kind of like inflects um, patterns of sexual desire. And I and I don't really want to open that up into, um, although, although I think on, <laughs> At the same time, like there's some kinds of, of, of sex acts. I mean, for example, like, you know, there's a kind of niche group of um, gay men 
uh, in the US who like to play out kind of plantation fantasies, often on historic plantations where like black men act out enslaved positions and white men, we can kind of get the drift of it. Um, and like on its face, that's sort of politically problematic. Um, and at the same time, like, you know, you don't want to take a critique of that and let that run into like all kind of like BDSM or all sorts of other forms of like, mm -hmm. you know, kink, especially queer kink. <clears throat> so one answer to the question is, well, I just don't think that this should be a project of like interrogating other people. I think this should be like primarily a kind of project that we take on ourselves and maybe explore with our sexual partners, right? Um, but the person who asked the first question used the phrase like joy, like I think it was like joyful affirmative joyful. consent. Yeah. And so I have this precise worry. So I worry not that a political critique of sex of the kind I want to offer um, narrows all sex down to like joyful affirmative sex, but that like the new affirmative consent paradigm is taking us exactly in that direction. So university students are increasingly taught in this country, in the US, elsewhere, that the only kind of sex they should be having is like, not just like consensual, but like, like sober, um, wanted, mutual, um, constantly affirmed, uh, you know, I mean, basically the sex that I think very few people at the age of 18 are having with each other, gay, straight, queer, whatever, right? In in part simply because very few 18-year-olds, I think, have a fully resolved sense of like mm -hmm. themselves as sexual subjects and agents. And there's got to be a place for tentativeness and messing up and making mistakes and like experimentation and trying things that then it turns out you didn't really want. And it would be, I think, very bad, very repressive and very infantilizing if we were to try and scrub that, scrub that clean. So from my perspective, the thing that's more dangerous is this kind of um, move towards like affirmative consent and affirmative consent codes. Because I think it holds up an, a single ideal of sex that um, people it's very hard, maybe impossible to achieve and to make that the defining characteristic of like permissible sex, I think is bad. What I prefer on the other hand is, is the embrace of a kind of cr more critical relationship to our own practices of sexuality, which I, I, I would hope can steer clear of a kind of moralism, a kind of authoritarianism, but like open ourselves up to the question of like, you know, what if I just like allowed my desire to go where it wants to rather than uh, it being shaped by like the political forces that want to, um, you know, normatively circumscribe it. That's not a complete answer, but I hope it's, 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 I think it's a, I think it's a very thorough answer. Um, <laughs> pornography. Now, I mean, any conversation of, about pornography should at least be honest, which is almost all men have obviously watched pornography. Mm -hmm. A large proportion of women, though lower than men, also have. Um, and the, the critique, a is very straightforward, people are aware of, but I will just sum it up, which is that straight porn in particular is simply riddled with misogyny, where mm -hmm. it, it, you know, in terms of the, it's the most concentrated example of women being objectified to fulfill the sexual needs of men. And it is frequently the forms of sexual encounters, which are presented in straight porn are not in any sense I think could be described as tender that often, I mean, I have to say as a queer person, whenever I've seen straight porn, it, it often does have often quite a, I would say it present often quite shockingly misogynistic, mm -hmm. uh, sexual practices. And so what would your, you know, what that there is a stand and also the, that a, a wider critique will also say, well, actually the industry of pornography is itself yes absolutely founded on the sexual exploitation of often vulnerable women. Mm. So what would your yeah. response, I suppose, be to that? That that kind of very, that that standard narrative, I suppose, by particularly a, a, a second wave feminism, I suppose. Right, yeah. So, I mean, porn was this, you know, hugely central issue um, in second wave feminism, especially in the US, but also in, in the UK, it sort of became ultimately the, in the US, the, 
the thing that divided and sort of collapsed the women's liberation movement. Um, and as you say, second wave anti-porn feminists, you know, basically want to say, look, uh, mainstream porn is like the ideological training ground of misogyny, right? It sort of teaches men how to then go out and relate to women. And it's not, and for the women who watch it, it teaches them how to relate to men, which is equally pernicious. But then also they, they thought of the industry it, itself as being <clears throat> built on the oppression of often already marginalized women. And that's a view that's like really fallen out of popularity. What's interesting is for me as a, as a university teacher is that it's an argument that really resonates with my students. Um, I think the reason is, is that they've come of age sexually with internet porn, which even we didn't do, right? So like we can remember a time before internet porn um, and, and, they, and they can't. So for them, they're- The modem. Yeah, no doubt it was difficult, but because you anyway, yeah, no, exactly, just took you know, too much time. Yeah, but when I say they came of age sexually, I mean like you know, for a lot of them, their very first sexual experiences will have been online or will be with like boys, usually who whose first sexual experiences were online, and that kind of changes and inflects that this current generation's um, relationship to pornography in kind of surprising and sort of old school ways. Now, on one hand, you know. All of my students, I'm glad to say, are, I think, instinctively anti-carceral, and they just recognize that recognize that you know trying to uh, police um, or criminalize pornography is just going to further um, harm the you know the women who tend to work in sex work, who tend to be very marginalized women. Not always, but they are often, um, you know, from working class backgrounds are, are trans or are undocumented and so on. So criminalization um, just like makes the, the worst off women worse off and that it's a ridiculous use of, of state power. But they still find the kind of diagnosis of like what porn does and the way it has this kind of pedagogical function, the way it teaches people how to have sex quite compelling. Um, and I think it's, it should be clear that what we're talking about is like mainstream porn including like mainstream gay porn, but usually like mainstream straight porn, um, because that's how young people interact with porn, right? They don't subscribe to like indie porn sites or feminist porn. What they do is they get their porn for free on Pornhub, which is, um, you know, an incredibly powerful company who basically steals content um, from like actual, um, you know, makers of this stuff. And, and, and profits hugely off it. So of course that, that, you know, Pornhub has on one hand like made the margin so slim in the actual porn industry. And of course, and that means that like the women who work in porn are very, are very uh, badly off. But it also has meant that a single company is basically in charge of like the algorithm uh, that everyone, almost everyone uses to decide like what they're going to get off to. I mean, that's wild, right? So Pornhub has an algorithm that like brings everyone's taste into conformity with each other. So we sometimes, you know, think of the internet or maybe like internet porn specifically as offering this like endless possibility and allows you to explore kink and blah, blah, blah. And that can be true if you like make a concerted effort. But if you just do the thing that most people do on the internet, which is go to the big search engine and just like put in some search terms, you're not going to be engaged in some kind of free inquiry or free exploration of your sexual desires. Your desires are going to be brought into conformity by an algorithm that wants you to be just like everyone else so that they can sell things to you. Um, a really interesting, well, there's lots of interesting parts, but I, I, I thought was very interesting was Grinder. So Grinder, mm -hmm. for those who aren't aware, was some of my straight friends used to go, are you on Growler again, Owen? <laughs> clear it's called grinder <laughs> grinder which is an app overwhelm is marketed it queer men it, there was a focus on hookups so people will generally they're not necessarily looking to meet their life partner though people have on grinder so let's not rule that out but it it tends to focus on on um people who want a a, a pretty prompt sexual encounter anyway yeah. Now, what you talk about is you talk about the experience of people of color on Grinder, And I find this really interesting, having spoken to and interviewed lots of people of color, queer people of color about this experience, because on the one side, you actually get this 
um, I mean, you know, racism in queer spaces is a big, big problem, which straight people often not necessarily aware of. But uh, so you'll often get people on apps, which I just don't think is the same on straight apps, um, where they will quite literally list the ethnicities that they are going to exclude from consideration in a sexual partner. Or the other side is fetishization. So you'll get, um, you know, whether it be uh, queer Arab men, for example, being fetishized in a certain way, black men being fetishized mm -hmm. in a certain way. So I'd just be interested about how you, yeah, how you, what, just to mm -hmm. unpack some of your thoughts on that. Well, just to stand up a little bit for the queer men, I mean, I do, I do think these same patterns uh, play out on um, straight apps, but I think that on the whole, I could be wrong about this, but I think on the whole, straight people are just like less um, open, right? So they're less likely to just like list their sexual preferences. And that's usually because I think in part because um, straight dating apps at least have like the veneer of being about romance, um, right? To make it kind of socially acceptable for women who've been socialized that they can't just like have a sexual encounter. Um, so to make it acceptable, you have to, you, you can't just boldly state your sexual preferences. And I think um, gay men feel like freer to just say what it is that like a lot of straight people are thinking. Yeah, because so people know a conversation in Grindr, it'll go like this. Hey, how are you? Yeah, fine. What are you up to? And then about maybe two or three questions in would be, what are you into? And then right. people will list the sexual encounters they're perhaps up for, their yeah. sexual role, top, bottom, first. Carry on, yeah. sorry. And like, on one hand, I think that's just great, right? I mean, um, uh, but then it often will manifest in, uh, you know, these kind of like deal breaker understandings of like one's own sexual desire, right? So like the phrase, I don't know, people are still saying this, but you know, there used to be like where people like no rice, no spice, meaning like no East Asian men, no South Asian men, yeah. um, or declaring themselves rice queens, meaning they have a kind of fetishization of, of, of Asian men. So the same kind of dynamics of like sorting uh, happen on straight apps, right? In which, you know, like thin blonde women, white blonde women are like get like the most interest and like black women get the like least interest you know um but i just think people are like less blunt about it right mm. uh it's very worrying mm. um but i mean it's interesting because on one hand it's like i don't think this is like grinder's fault right i mean these are dynamics that pre-existed um social dating apps and you know hookup apps um, on the other hand, there is this way in which like the hookup app and the dating app sort of institutionalize mm -hmm. um, certain practices of, of sexual racism like on our screen by making it so easy for us to um, declare like our deal breakers mm -hmm. um, or our, our, you know, the only people we'll look at. And the reason I think this is um, sad, I mean, one thing is like, you know, from, and you've had this experience too, when you talk to like, you know, the queer people who are like on these apps um, of color who have this repeated experience of like seeing how other people are seeing them. I mean, it's just like an assault to their dignity yeah. in the, and, it, and it's just like harder to go through the world in that way. Um, and uh, whether they're being fetishized or, or excluded. I also think though that it reinforces a certain kind of like logic of sexual desire and preference where we don't think of ourselves as being open to like being surprised by our desire right because what happens in ordinary life like you're at the bar and you I mean, say you're at a bar remember those um and you talk to someone and they for some reason like for whatever reason like they don't fit your understanding of like what you'd normally be into but they kind of like just bring you up short and they surprise you and like those are very um not only are those very like exciting moments, they're they're very like ethically important, I think, right? Because they also happen in like friendship, they happen in other things, right? They don't just happen in terms of like sexual and romantic attraction. And I think one casualty of this kind of like online dating and online hookup apps is that, is that very human experience of attraction and desire leading you to like someone or to some place that you you in part because of your like political preconceptions just didn't think you would you would ever be attracted to.
Just a couple of other questions because we've covered so much ground. But I mean, this is again, well, we covered partly, but sex, sex positive, sex positivity, I suppose. Mm. And this again, some of the fracture lines in feminism, it, mm. it, it kind of very much, you know, you can see these divides in 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 feminism or over other issues. But there's this particular one where you'll often get actually um, feminists who call themselves sex positive. And then often second wave feminists or who style themselves as such will say in their Twitter bios, feminist, but not the fun, fun kind. <laughs> and they will often describe, self-describe sex positive feminists as, well, they will basically question their feminism and say, actually, this is just trying to provide a veneer of feminism to mm. trying to, you know, surrender to the sexual whims of men and dress that up as feminism. I mean, that's it. I suppose that is essentially the argument that I keep seeing. Yeah. That's, so I'm trying to, it's, it's interesting when I'm trying to put to you what particular factions describe, and I'm trying to do it in a way where they can't say you've not accurately summed up mm -hmm. that description, but that's, that's what they'll say, I suppose. So what's your take on that? Right. I mean, so sex, sex positive feminism emerges out of a kind of dissatisfaction with the radical feminism of the 70s. Um, so, you know, the radical feminists of the 70s were very interested in subjecting kind of sexual desire and sexual practices and romantic practices to a kind of political critique. And at the kind of extreme, they advocated for forms of separatism, right? So not having any kind of relations with men or, or political lesbianism, right? So the embrace of lesbian relationships um, as a way of kind of dis disaffiliating from uh, heterosexuality, not simply uh, as an expression of kind of, you know, sexual orientation. <clears throat> and, and, you know, there's this, this like group of, of feminists, um, sort of most famously Ellen Willis, who kind of gives us the notion of like pro-sex or sex positive feminism, um, who felt that that worldview basically reinforced the idea of women as um, like mere victims of male sexual license. It didn't respect the idea of women as themselves, uh, sexual subjects, sexual agents in the world who should be free to pursue like their own sexual projects who were deserving of sexual pleasure and so on. And so like that becomes this like major fault line in, in the seventies. And I think broadly speaking, the sex positivists have won out, right? So that's why we have a contemporary mainstream feminist discourse in which like, well, as long as it involves two consenting adults, it's okay. Um, you know, if like you want it, then it's then it's fine. And and I think a lot of kind of um, people who are nostalgic for the second wave for 1970s feminism, like the kind of critics you're talking about, worry converges with a very kind of like liberal and in fact neoliberal logic so a kind of liberal market logic where like well as long as like two people are consenting to a contractual arrangement like a contractual exchange it's fine we don't need to interrogate why certain people for example need to like sell their labor or like why certain people are attracted um you know want to act out submissive roles so that's the critique i think Activity. Look, it's just liberalism. Like they're not interested in the kind of political critique. And what that means is that women just have to have sex on men's terms, right? Um, and so, in one sense, I think that uh, that critique has something going for it because it is true that I think we focus too much on consent. I think it is true that we don't think enough about like the formation of our sexual desires. We don't think specifically about how something like racism forms our sexual desires. Um, and also I think, and this brings up the kind of ne neoliberal aspect of all of this, we often in mainstream culture talk about sex as this like luxury good, right? So it's like, like having the right kind of sex and having enough sex is like part of what makes me like the perfect like Instagram subject, right? So it's part of like this broader project of, um, of like individual self-perfection as like a kind of form of like commodity. It's, um, at the same time, what I think this critique of sex positivity like misses is just like the history of persecution <laughs> against gay people and lesbians and, you know, um, like 
gay and lesbian people had to wor work very, very hard um, to get to a place where we, where at least in some places and fairly precariously, it's believed that if you've consented to a sexual uh, engagement with another consenting adult, like it's okay and not the business of anyone else and not the business of the state. And it's really important, and Maggie Nelson makes this uh, point in her new in her new book, which is really, really fantastic, um, that to remember that like sex positivity really comes to like prominence during the AIDS pandemic, mm -hmm. right? This time in the in the 80s and then the 90s where um, like homosexual desire was seen as like fundamentally pathological and something that like deservedly led to your death, yeah. right? And so against that backdrop, um, sex positivity, this like emphasis on just like, if it's consensual, like it's okay, is politically really radical. I think where we are right now in the 21st century, we're like ready to like re-interrogate sex positivity and have a more complex mm -hmm. Uh, version of it, one that goes beyond just consent and really takes up the original kind of project of sex positivity that you see in someone like Ellen Willis, which is like demands true sexual liberation um, along every axis and that wants to destabilize like heteronormative sexuality altogether, right? Like a really properly queer project. So I think sex positivity has kind of lost its queer edge and it's time for it to come back. Just before I ask my final question, um, I, I think it, I mean, you mentioned Sean Fay's book, The Transgender Issue, which is also coming out soon, which everyone really should uh, read and buy. It's a brilliant book. But I am interested in your thoughts about the very British speci British mm -hmm. variant, I suppose. Obviously, transphobia <laughs> is not a British-specific problem. But the British variant of transphobia, in that, again, without glamorising the situation in the United mm -hmm. States, there is a clearer sense that transphobia should be in its explicit form associated with the Republican political right, mm -hmm. that there is more of a consensus, it's not absolute, but there is more of a consensus ranging from centrist, liberal to left, which mm -hmm. is trans inclusive, that mainstream feminism is far more likely to present itself as, as trans inclusive. And again, not to whitewash the politics or records of Joe Biden or Kamala Harris, but you know, the vice president of the United States has her pronouns in her Twitter bio. And one of the first acts of the government uh, of, of their administration was um, an LGBTQ ordinance, which restored certain rights to uh, trans people. And then the top trend in Britain that day was Biden erases women. Just another normal day on a perfectly normal island. What do you think? Because there is a moral panic in much of the media, not just the right-wing press, the liberal press, the liberal media and liberal commentators, which is obsessive, I would say, and increasingly radicalised. Mm. And it does often show, I think, the features of a cult, people who've been often vulnerable people, they've read material online and they've gone through lots of rabbit holes. And you can see that in terms of the way they talk and communicate and often a very obsessive way. But it is often, you know, reproducing a lot of the rhetoric that was traditionally targeted by much of the media against mm. cisgender, gay and bisexual people. What's your just thoughts on what's going on and what, why, you know, lots of people have theories about why in Britain there is amongst so-called progressives, mm. liberals, even pe people on the left, amongst feminists, there is a divide that isn't the same in the United States. Yeah, I do. I really don't. So I don't, I don't know. I mean, there's, as you say, there's like lots of different um, hypotheses. I mean, I think we need a, a very good sociology or a history of, of this period, um, which I think is only something you can really kind of do in, in, in retrospect, um, mm -hmm. with a little bit more distance. I mean, you know, so someone like uh, Sophie Lewis has talked about the, uh, like the specific, um, British relationship to like its own imperial past and how that has, you know, how that plays into <clears throat> the culture. I mean, Andrea Long Chu and Katie Baker have both written about like online culture. I mean, uh, Andrea Long Chu has this wonderful line where she's like, basically like, look, this has very little to do with the second wave and has everything to do with, you know, that very particular phenomenon uh, that we call like trolling, right? Which like the internet 
ethnographers of the future will have to explain. Katie Baker's written about Mumsnet as an incredibly effective um, platform for the radicalization of women who for like very good reason feel justified grievance about the sidelining of like young mothers, the eradication or at least the eroding of, of like material state support for families and mothers and who end up um, turning that legitimate grievance like against the so-called trans lobby. So I do think you're right, there is a kind of process of radicalization where you have lots of women who I think have justified grievances and then are taught to target those grievances at what in fact is like a tiny minority of the population um, who are, you know, um, disenfranchised in, in all sorts of ways. But I think that's only part of the story and we haven't got the kind of com complete story. Um, yeah, it's, and, and of course there's like a, a specific story about British media and the fact that um, even our like so-called left um, organs or like, you know, left leftist uh, mainstream organs have um, think that, uh, you know, well, basically have just turned over a vast amount of textual real estate to people who at once claim that what they want are like more open and difficult and honest conversations about complexities of like identity and gender and sex. But whenever they're confronted with those conversations, like shut them down in the most ideological and like policing way possible, which just gives a lie, I think, to the idea that what they're concerned about is free debate and tells the truth, which was that they're concerned about is like, you know, the, the public recognition of like the rights of trans women and to a lesser extent trans men, which they're just like less obsessed about. Um, I mean, I'll say one thing that might be going on, just like a bit of total historical speculation. The US has seen, has had a very particular history of feminists aligning with Republicans, with conservatives um, because of the porn wars. So you had very left feminists in their fight against pornography, um, aligning with like the Reagan administration, mm -hmm. right? Giving testimony to Reagan's Mies Commission, working with Republican legislators to create legislation, which, you know, the feminists just wanted to outlaw porn or not outlaw, rather, sorry, allow, you know, women who are harmed by pornography to sue pornographers. But in some cases uh, that legislation was also just used um, like, to basically like criminalize uh, homosexuality, of course, which the feminists didn't want. And so I think it's possible that feminists in the US have no, no more remember better what happens when you collude with the right. And so they just are, are more in the practice of saying like, who are our allies here and why? And I, and I think it's just something that like feminists in this country don't do enough of. And it's really, really politically disturbing. Just finally, because we've had such, I mean, your answers have been absolutely brilliant and um, we've covered so much ground, but just finally, I mean, it's just linked to what you just said, but you know, your, your people who've read your book, by the way, and uh, all my friends who've read it are bowled over by it. It's had a big, big impact on them. It's a genuinely stunning piece of work, which I think will stand the test of time for a very, very long time. Um, I'm just interested in what you think about some of the media responses to it and what that tells us. <laughs> um, well, I've been very lucky to have some fantastic readers of the book. So Zing, who um, wrote like a really lovely review, uh, a profile of me for Vogue, just I thought really understood what I was trying to trying to do in the book. And I don't think she like necessarily agreed with everything, but I think what she really appreciated in the book um, is my attempt to do something like ambivalent and complex, yeah. right? So it was it's really important for me when I'm taking on any of these issues, whether it's like Me Too or porn or campus sex or carceralism to like practice a kind of radical form of like thinking about with your opponent. Like, I don't think that that's a practice that we should just like cede to liberals because liberals never do it well. Right. I mean, liberals do it usually as a cover to support some kind of reactionary agenda. Right. Mm -hmm. But like, I think there is a kind of radical practice of ambivalence that, that we can embrace. What's interesting to me is that um, other commentators in the British press, some of the, the people you've mentioned who've worked for these kind of like supposedly left organs or who work for um, clearly uh, right wing reactionary organs, like, 
who are the very people who are always calling for like free debate and a more subtle um, and ambivalent and complex conversation about these issues rush to shut it down, yeah. right? They react very, very badly when you actually offer it to them. Um, and I think that's, um, I, I mean, this is my naivete, I guess. I'm, I, I was like, I'm like disappointed by that. Well, um, <laughs> yes, yes. And that's why I'm saying I was naive because this is precisely what I should have expected. No, honestly, I just I feel like, I mean, I've worked in this industry for 10 years and I don't know, I'm not going to apologize, but I've just realized I'm not going to apologize on behalf of the industry. I've given my own experience. I'm not going to apologize on behalf of an industry who there was mutual contempt between me and my own industry. Anyway, that was absolutely brilliant. Really, really appreciate it. We, pro we, we went through, as I said, a, such a, a broad array of topics, which you always answered so lucidly and beautifully. The Right to Sex is an absolutely phenomenal book, which everybody should immediately get a copy of and read and just spread the word um because it really is nuanced it goes into the complexities it, it, it talks about these gray areas in ways which are very subtle and very informative but uh thank you so so much it's a real honor thank you Owen. i've loved having this conversation